Evening, everyone, to tonight's episode of Profound States. We have a very special guest tonight, Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, PhD. She's a lifelong contactee, and she has an online individual group, Extra Consciousness Coaching, and co created intensive strengthen and integrate participants or a group where she uh, strengthens and integrates participants' psychic experiences to advance their contributions, expertise, and leadership. She's a futurist, author, coach, and host of Extra Consciousness Humans TV. Uh, in 2016, she founded the Institute of Extra Consciousness, Advanced Experiences, Self-Knowledge, and Co-Creation, uh, and Co-Creations. Uh, and welcome to tonight's show. Thank you, Charles. Wonderful to be here. So let's get right into it. So, uh, what was the very first odd occurrence in your life of any kind? Could be anything. Uh, the, um, my first uh, anomalous occurrences were, um, I'm a childhood experiencer. My first uh, conscious awareness of my contact was um, when I was about three years old. I was aware of beings um, around me in my bedroom. Um, I, um, I was a childhood contactees for the most part. It's a seamless integration because we don't know enough to critically think about what's happening to us. And so we, we sort of effortlessly sl slide between these different worlds that other people maybe have a hard time integrating and and um, navigating. So um, as I got older, I was raised in Clarksburg, West Virginia, coal mining town, small town. Um, the earth was porous, <laughs> uh, and uh, I I was allowed a lot of freedom as a very young child in Clarksburg. And I had two simultaneous memories as a very young child. So um, I was aware that these beings were also um, connected to um, craft, to UFOs, to craft. And I spent time on the craft that I could remember as a child. I had a mentor. I was very aware that I was there with other people that at different times in my life, I've come to recognize that we meet each other <laughs> and know each other um, because we were probably participating in in, in that same um, arena. So I, I went to like what I would call star school. And then we could talk about it later on. But as I went into adulthood, that initial childhood experience became more of an adult experience. But to stay with the childhood, I, I I had very vivid memories of a child of being taken under the ground. So I was um, I, I was um, pulled under the ground, and I was aware of what was going on under the ground in um, in another in another dimension uh, under the ground and the bees that were there. And I also had a keen knowing even then as a child that somehow these these two um, different places that I was visiting were were connected, that the underground was connected to the ships and the UFOs and the, the, uh, the beings, and that they were also connected to the beings that were underground. It was kind of like one and the same system. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize until well into adulthood what I was doing under the ground. And, um, uh, it's one of those vivid memories. I, I was living in uh, Scott in uh, I was living in a little town outside of Scottsdale, Arizona. It's called Fountain, Fountain Hills. And I was sitting on my porch reading a book about shamans and about how shamans do their work and how they're transported to different dimensions, oftentimes doing work under the ground. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I, I must have come in as a shaman and been doing that work, not consciously knowing what I was doing, but because I was shifting those dimensions so easily as a child, um, it just came naturally to me. And um, 
I uh, I was comfortable under the ground. I was comfortable in the ships, both. So do you, did you ever come to um, name the dimension you were in? You know, was it the astral plane or was it some... Um, well, there was actually, to me, there, there was a physical feeling that I was I was physically going into under that ground. So there was a physical component to it. Oftentimes when you're when you're in the astral plane, you don't really have a physical component to it as much as I did. I had a physical feeling of going under there and then I had a physical feeling of coming and popping out of there. I didn't have those feelings as much on the ships, they were more, that that was more of, um, could have been an astral feeling on the ships when I was traveling. But once again, I was very young. So I didn't, I didn't have the critical thinking skills to understand what was happening. The, the only time I was really frightened as a child as such was when um, I, I had a very vivid memory of, of of, of the the brown cloaked figures in my bedroom one night, and that was very off putting for me. I didn't know what they were doing there. I didn't know they were very cloaked. I was unable to see who they were, and they um, they emitted an energy that was difficult for me to be around. And I remember being very scared of that. But these other experiences I had. No, I, I didn't really have any um, trauma or fear or feel like, felt like I was being abducted. And like, actually quite the opposite. I felt like I had come into Earth somehow wired to be able to do this, if that makes sense. Um, actually, I think a lot of children are. I think a lot of children are. I, I'm a mom. I think a lot of children are nat- naturally psychic and they... And they can easily navigate um, psychic realities and different and different dimensions and and move in different spaces and be a shaman and be a healer and and uh, communicate with beings quite easily. It's only you know through human indoctrination do we end up losing those abilities. So what did the what did the beings in the uh, brown cloak uh, cloaks? What did they look like? They kind of felt like um, that the gnome creatures in the brown with the brown cloaks, like they didn't want to be seen. Um, They didn't feel I don't I don't know that I even knew what evil was back then. So So, I just knew that you couldn't see their faces. No. Mm -mm. Okay, well, go on with uh, what what were the encounters with those cloaked creatures? What? What were they like? What what made you scare them? I have no idea other than as a child, I sensed that having had other experiences, even under the ground, that I did not care for their, the energy that they were emitting. And maybe they were fine and it was just me, but um, who, who, it doesn't matter. Whatever the person is that goes into this work, you just have to trust the frequency that you're picking up and what your comfort level with it is. And, and so, I, as a child, was not comfortable with that. So go, uh, go on with your story. Uh, go either talk about what happened with the cloaked, brown cloaked beings or go to the next experience. Well, it's interesting because um, they've never reappeared. <laughs> And I've had a lot of contact ever since then, and they have never reappeared. So they were in your bedroom once. Yes, and they have never reappeared. And they didn't take you anywhere. No. Okay, well, go on. I mean, I've never, I've never, I've never really been regressed about that, but I don't, they, I've never been, um, I'm good at being conscious when I'm being contacted, the kind of being that's contacting me. I'm, I'm pretty good at being conscious of that. And I have not been conscious of them contacting me. So, so as I said, you know, I went through my childhood. I I had a little bit of a of an idyllic childhood because being in that small town and having a lot of freedom. And then um, 
you know, went to school and got my advanced degrees. And um, I was always interested in ufology and uh, I think, um, you know, just followed it academically, read books and, and tried to to uh, understand this, these other dimensions of life. And then I had my children, got married, had my children. And, you know, that's a very, for a woman, that's very all encompassing. I mean, you're more, <laughs> you're more worried about, although I did have, even with my children, I had some very um, enlightening experiences, but the most profound experience was when I moved to Phoenix and I, I, I was living in Dayton, Ohio at the time, married and living in Dayton, Ohio at the time when we moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And I ended up in this little town called Fountain Hills and met a woman named Ruth Hover, Dr. Ruth Hover. Well, Dr. Ruth Hover at, was running the um, probably the longest running uh, experience or contactee group in the nation at the time. <laughs> as life would have it, and I get plopped there. And um, she became a very, very good friend and mentor to me. So Ruth Ruth, and John Mack and uh, Leo Sprinkle were three people that were working in peer together. So John Mack's peer group at Harvard. So she was collaborating with John Mack and Harvard and, and, and Leo Sprinkle. Um, John and Leo and Ruth have all three passed away. But what, what they were trying to do was uh, find a way to communicate to experiencers. And for John, of course, people are pretty, your listeners are probably aware of what his work was. Um, he, 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 right out of the box, he began testing experiencers and was able to say right away that they're not crazy, they're not insane, but these these experiences are real that was that were happening to them. So it was the first time in my life that I was able to sit in a group of people like myself who were also experiencers, which is a pretty wonderful, unique thing to happen. So what city what city were you at the time? I, I was outside of Phoenix. I was outside of Phoenix, outside of Scottsdale in Scottsdale. Mountain Hills. Scottsdale. Yeah, outside of Scottsdale. In yeah, my wife lived in that area for a while, so she's familiar with it. Yeah. So oh. that 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 era, I would say, kicked off a very dramatic phase of my contact from that time. It's like, for example. I was on board at the craft as a child, and I remember when I was then an adult living in Fountain Hills, I, I would have a lot of orb activity, and the orbs would buzz and wake me up about squeal, kind of like dolphin squeal, about two o'clock in the, every morning, they would like wake me up, and they would, the ceiling of my bedroom, so I was awake, but the ceiling of my bedroom would become like a 3D um, cuneiform type of printout. And they would push down these symbols and activations onto me um, at night. And I was very aware that these symbols and this activation were connected with my childhood that this was not the first time I was seeing this. It's just that I was seeing this now as an adult, not as a child. So who was giving you the the data, the information, the, the symbols? It's interesting. So during that time, so the the orbs were a precursor to, to the activation happening. But during that time, Charles, I was very, I was very aware of many different races and having contact with many different races. I feel from my childhood, my primary contact was tall whites from my childhood. Kind of um, a large tall white um, mentor that I had. And I think a lot of that later in adulthood information was coming also from that race. But I was also being contacted by mantis beings, which I'm contacted to this day. I'm connected to mantis beings to this day. Um, also 
Pleiadians, Syrians, Lyrians. I just... I, I just I always felt like I was sort of like a Heinz 57 contactee because I was supposed to be that and that they were I was even in contact with the beings that looked like I don't know if you've seen pictures of them, but they looked like square refrigerators <laughs> like not to mention, of course, because I was underground, I had a lot of reptilian contact. So I was able to also recognize that. So insectoid, reptilian, humanoid. We want to hear all of those experiences. (laughs) (laughs) Don't skip anything. Uh, Well, you know, they all just kind of blended in. I, I, I feel like the mantis beings are very much about healing, about the human physical body and teaching us about about that how the physical body works so i've had times in my life when i've i've like injured like a a knee or an elbow and the mantis beans will show up during that time and 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 lead me through like like this is what you need to do this is you know how you because a, a lot of people have stories of oh the mantis heals healed me and yeah there's there's an aspect to the mantis healing you but also you're a human and so you have to like go to physical therapy and go to the gym and you know heal the wound and 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 live your part as a human so interestingly enough in terms of the the mantis beans um I'm, I, I work a lot with Brazil. So I work down in Brazil with a group called Circulo and um, they were in Sao Paulo and now they're down in Curitiba in Brazil. And I was in Sao Paulo with them and they had a healing clinic, which was kind of went through phases in this healing clinic. And first it was, you know, you kind of gathered together. It was just full of people and their animals, their dogs, their cats. Uh, many, many of them very poor, very poor people. And then they would they would be kind of like this holding area. And then they, they would sit on these long benches and wait to go into the healing room. And in the healing room, there were um, probably six healers. So there'd be six beds and six healers in, in the room. And, um, and I... Not many people were taken back there, but I knew the woman who had founded the clinic and she it was very much of an honor that she took me back to the back of the clinic where they were actually healing people. And they had them hooked up to computers and they were they were scientifically monitoring because Brazilians are very much um, aware of the need to integrate science and spirituality or science and healing. So. I said, you know, who are who are they healing with? And one person was healing with uh, with a um, an aquatic being. And I have people in my group who have memories of being aquatic beings in other lifetimes. Uh, another person uh, was healing with a mantis. Uh, another person with a Pleiadian. And then some people were um, were from the Amazon, and they were healing with Amazon spirits back in the room and then then you'd leave that healing room and you would then be ushered into a, a long it looked like a long like in the movies those big long hospital corridors that they have in movies where there's like 15 beds 20 beds and people would be on these beds after their healing and then reiki they, they would be working with a, a reiki practitioner kind of nurse would be working with them to integrate the healing that they'd receive and those those Reiki practitioners back in back in the room were actually um, they went through a three year program to do that. It wasn't just, you know, I'll take a weekend course on the Internet and do Reiki. It's like, oh, no, no, you know, you'll do you'll do three years of training with us <laughs> before you're allowed to be a practitioner. So they it's, it's a very different approach to and a lot of the people that were doing that work were actually physicians and nurses in their in their normal you know everyday nine to five life so they would come and work at the clinic as a healer it's very different from american culture Uh, very yeah there's no comparison and i had always my whole life um 
so I come from a religious background. I went to I went to Boston University School of Theology and got my Master of Divinity d- degree. And so I was always very um, connected spiritually to everything I did. And I always kept wondering, like, what's what's the deal here? Like, Christians are supposed to go heal people. Like, why doesn't anybody know how to heal people? Like, that's something we need to learn how learn how to do. And actually, there was a a Methodist church, I'm a Methodist, so there was a Methodist church in Baltimore, actually, that was probably the preeminent healing church in all of Methodism. This um, this woman was a healer, and they would they would um, they would send out healing to people all over. By then, it was by either telephone or by letter, and they would heal people all over all over um, in that little church in Baltimore. And it's only when I got to uh, Brazil, I was like, whoa, these people get it. <laughs> they, they get what they're doing. So take us through some of your alien experiences, your mantids, or, you know, you've you've had contact with a lot of different races. Uh, take the audience through some of those experiences. I would say that... Um, There have been times that I've worked with um, councils of different beings um, that are that are all a little similar. Um, I would go back to a lot of the the tall white um, beings that um, that I work with. I I think that when you say tall white, you mean they look like grays, but they're white and they're tall. they're, They're white and they're tall. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure they're insect type, an insect type race. Well, I, I, to me, they looked more humanoid. So maybe, maybe they were say, more when you say or... humanoid. Well, th- that implies two legs, two arms, and head and eyes, but that doesn't really. Right. If you think they look, if you say they look like humans, then, then please yeah. just say that, you know. Yeah, I would say they look like humans to me. They oh, look okay. like humans. All right. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and go ahead with your story. Anna. So a lot of my, um, you know, anytime you're a contactee, sometimes you get hit over the head with information, and sometimes you get what I would call a subtle download of information that you really don't understand. So throughout my life, especially during that time when I was living in Fountain Hills, I I would get a lot of downloads. I would just be, I would, my body would know that I am being contacted and I am being downloaded with information that I need to receive. And there was a time when it was new to me, probably happened to me as a child, but I wasn't as aware of it, but it was new to me as an adult. And (laughs) I would... Whatever I was doing, if I was at work, I w- if I was at home, especially if I was at home, I would I, I I would I would I would lie down on the bed and and let the download come in, so that I was very sure that the energetic information that I was receiving was going to come in in its complete form. That was a big deal to me for a long time. I I don't have to do that as much now, but. A, a lot of it came through. Um, this is interesting. So I had journals full of transmissions that I had received, and um, I had a leak in my garage, and they all turned to mold, and I had to throw them away. So it's kind of like that was a phase. Everything was written down. All those downloads were written down, and then there was like, okay, this is this is done. But that's that's also very common for experiencers. I'll just give you an example of that. Um, so when I was when I was first married and had my children, I was I, I, my um, husband's passed away, but um, we had quite a bit of money. We were very, very, very well off. And then all of a sudden, boom, that phase is over. <laughs> Like you're done with that phase, you're moving to, to Phoenix, and you're gonna do completely different work. And it's it's almost like when you have money, 
you can navigate life pretty easily on a surface level, right? You can travel, you can meet people, you can network, you can be asked to do things. Life is very easy with money. When you don't have money, and I ended up being a single parent with three children to raise, it's almost like um, a blindfold, I would say, was put on me. Like you have, the, it's almost like an initiation. The blindfold's on you. You don't know where your next paycheck or your next meal, you can do your best on that. But there was always this overlay of uncertainty, almost like there was a, a blindfold across me. And I had to, it's almost like like you turn a child, like the old initiation stories where they turn the children out into the woods and they blindfold them and they have to find their way home. They're kind of like those Celtic initiation mystery. I don't know if they're true or not, but that was one of the stories that they had to sort of feel their way home. For probably 10 years, I felt my way psychically through life in order to survive and raise my children. And I think that included, I think that happened to me probably, I chose to do that at some point in my incarnation. But what it did was it made me become just kind of like that that scripture um, for um, a wealthy person to go through the eye of the needle or a camel to go through the eye of the needle. I mean, that's really true. I mean, you almost have to be through illness or circumstances. You almost, if you're really going to learn to, com to connect, communicate, and co-create with extraterrestrial and interdimensional beings, spiritual beings, because I have had angelic experiences, then there has to be a time when you don't know what to do and you don't know where to go and and you have to rely on that on 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 those heightened sensitivity some people call it sixth sense um in order to to navigate life and i i did that for a good 10 years and part of those 10 years then was um learning that you know not only was I was my psychic intelligence getting a lot keener. It's like if you're a chess player, you start at your first your first game of chess, you're probably not very good. Your second game of chess, you're a little bit better. By the time you've played, you know, a thousand games of chess, you're pretty good. It's the same thing with psychic ability. By the time you've been shuttled into a situation where you've had to use your psychic ability for the you know, 500,000th time because other people are depending on you, your children are depending on you, your family's depending on you, then you get pretty good at it. You get pretty good at where to go, what to do and what to think. And so to, to give you an example of the guidance. So one morning I was, um, I was in bed and my um, alarm clock went off. You know, those radio alarm clocks would go off. My alarm clock went off and, um, I hit that snooze button because I thought, oh, I just hit that. I remember my pillow, my head hitting back down that pillow. And I just thought I I, I have to sleep uh, just like five more minutes. Like get, these kids got to get them to school. I have to get to work. I, I just need to sleep. And all of a sudden, the word exoconsciousness didn't come in my head. I didn't like take a paper and write it down, think it up. But Charles, that word came in my body. In my body, not in my head, in my body. It's that it's that kind of biblical, um, mystical. I think it's the book of John and the word became flesh. The word became flesh inside of me. It went into my DNA. It went into my flesh. And I knew that that word exoconsciousness was going to be my work for the rest of my life. And the funny thing is. That. I lived in Phoenix, right? So 1997, Phoenix Lights, right? <laughs> Phoenix Lights, largest mass sighting, one of the largest mass sightings in the nation. Guess what? I didn't see the Phoenix Lights. 
I have friends everywhere in the experiencer community and the ufology community in Phoenix. Not one person calls me, nor am I drawn to go outside and see the Phoenix lights. But what happened was I knew when I didn't see the Phoenix lights, I knew, yeah, I'm supposed to do consciousness. I'm supposed to do exo consciousness. Had I been like many of my friends here in Phoenix and seen the lights, I would have become a craft researcher for sure. I've been, you know, at UFO Twitter craft researcher. <laughs> so you spent time on the craft, yes? Yes. Can you tell us some of those, one or more of those experiences? Um, I, I had, I had a, this is funny. I had not, not really connected the two things till just now, but um, I had a mentor on the craft and I would, I would be taken to his room and he was a male. I would be taken to his room and I would go, I, I would be mentored by him in his room. Tall white? A tall white that I perceived to be a tall white. Okay. And then there were other, but he was, he was tall, he was white, but he was also had kind of that spiritual etheric um, complexity to him. Um, and then, then I was taken to other parts of the craft, you know, the medical parts, I was taken frequently to these big auditoriums where there were a lot of other people in, in these auditoriums. But my most my most vivid memory was being with that mentor on that craft. And that there were things that I was taught that I was to do. Um, almost like a, like a, not a coach, but like a mentor. I don't know how else to say it, but I'll give you an example of how that unfolded later in my life then. So I went to undergraduate school and I'm going to go to Boston University. I'm going to go um, to get my master's of divinity. And my dad it was, was very well educated. He, he got his PhD from Columbia and he, he was always, he was just a really a true academic and but also a really caring pastor of a church. And I'll never forget, he's dropping me off in front of the house I'm supposed to live in on, on Back Bay there in Boston. And he takes me aside and he goes, I'm going to tell you something. He said, don't take classes. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, <laughs> I'm going to school. I'm going to take classes. He goes, you'll have to take some classes. But he said, this is what you do. You're going to go in there and you're going to find yourself a mentor and you're going to be with this mentor for the next three years of your education. And he's going to teach you one on one. That's going to be your education. And I'm like, oh, OK, I wasn't in that school, but maybe a week, maybe. And the dean of the school pulls me in his office and he goes, hey, you know, I heard you heard you study Carl Jaspers. He's a Swiss. He was a Swiss philosopher. I'd gone to school in Basel, Switzerland. And. And he said, heard you study Carl Jaspers? And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, there's a man over in the philosophy department and he's a Jaspers scholar and, and, and got a mirror and Nietzsche. And he said, uh, you, you need to go over there and work with him. <laughs> he said, you, you need to go over there and do directed study with him. <laughs> he needs to be your mentor. So man was my mentor for the next three years. So it's almost like there was a, and, and we, I sat through those three years, kind of like if you went to Oxford or Cambridge, and we read through all of the classics of philosophy, and I learned critical thinking, and I learned I, I, I learned um, a lot of academic, I gained academic abilities through him that I, I would have never, ever had. And um, he was actually the first person when I got out and started working and published my book on exoconsciousness, he reached out to me and he said, um, do a do a do a presentation on exo consciousness for the American Philosophical Association. I'm like, you're kidding me. He goes, no, do it on that. And I mean, that was a real funny thing too. So, sitting in this place in Baltimore and in this in this hotel room in this big conference room, and these two guys are in front of me, and they go, have you heard? There's somebody's gonna. This is like back in probably 90, uh, 2005, 2006. And this one guy looks at the other guy, and he goes. 
have you heard there's somebody here they're going to talk about extraterrestrials <laughs> and I poked him on the shoulder and like they're making all these comments and I poked him on the shoulder and I go hey guys it's me <laughs> but um that was interesting it's so it's I think once your your life starts to align with with where you're supposed to go it, it's it's not that you just have these extraterrestrial experiences but it's that you have them in human life and they're replicated, if that makes sense. Uh, what do you mean? That that my extraterrestrial, my vivid extraterrestrial experiences was that I worked with a mentor, that I had I, I had this mentor on the ship and he, he was working with me and he was he was probably honing honing me in terms of um who knows maybe putting in activations that would come out later but that that one-on-one -on -one was something that i needed to have and then later in my life educationally i end up with that i end up with that another type of one-on-one -on -one association with someone so, so tell us uh, another experience you had with an alien I would say that I did have the gray experiences when I was on board the ship. I did, I did, I did have gray experiences. Go ahead. We want and, to hear them all. Pardon me? We want to hear them all. Uh, um, my gray experiences were more at an arm's length distance, if that makes sense. I, I don't really have as much recall of that other people talk about where they were on the tables and they were they they were um, being examined. I don't have that. I just remember that there was a presence of grays there around me and I, I could see them and that they they were present. This is a very interesting part of some of my encounters on the ship. On some of my encounters, there were United States military present. So I've heard, I hear room. I hear. Uh, I've heard quite a few rumors of my labs on the ground and mm -hmm. aliens and humans working together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in various different capacities. And you now it's it's just mm -hmm. a snippet here and there. You really don't. Mm -hmm. get details mm -hmm. well so, one thing uh, i was told this, so this was very interesting i remember as a child now this is as a child so i remember as a child seeing them and i'm a child on that craft and being warned that i was not to make fun of them i was not to approach them but I for sure wasn't to make fun of them and I was to respect them as adults being here. And I had the feeling that- You're talking they, about the humans on the crowd. The military, that yeah. they, they got kind of like the message to me was, these, these are human adults who maybe didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and that I was to remain a respectful child to them and not not you know be disrespectful to them but keep them at arm's length and i never i never remember any of them approaching me but i could remember them trying to figure out so they were adult men so i was a child so this was this was effortless for me but they were adult men trying to figure out what the heck they were doing that that was the sense i got that I probably knew more what I was doing than they knew what they were doing, if that makes sense. Well, do you think they were in a trance or uh, controlled or what do you? Um... I did sense that they were controlled. I, I sensed oftentimes that they were quite confused. If you're in a trance, you're not confused, you're in a trance. Okay, so. Yeah, I didn't really sense that. You're going to have no, to give, I, I, fit, give us the context that you think it would all, the larger context of what uh, 
you know, why were they doing what they were doing if they were not entranced, if they were cooperating, but yet they were... They were more observers. observers. They weren't doing anything. They were just observing. They were just there to observe. So they weren't... It felt like the kind of interface that I was having with the beings, they weren't having. They, they, they were there. It's kind of like when you're a teacher and um, the principal or the assistant principal comes in and observes your classroom. Well, she doesn't, he or she doesn't really know what's going on in your classroom, right? They just drop in for the day, drop in for the hour. That's what I felt that the military was doing. So did you ever get a sense of where they fit into the larger context as in, okay, so they're observing, they're not participating, but um, were they subordinate to, equal to, how did, how did they, how do you think? Oh, they were not in charge in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so they weren't in charge, they're not in trance. They were they're invited. Observe, they're observing only. They're invited by, observers. Mm-hmm. Right. That was my so, sense. So you think that they were just invited there to see what the aliens were doing with Mm -hmm. other humans. Mm -hmm. They're just making a note of what Mm -hmm. the aliens are doing with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're just keeping track. So give us. I don't even know if they knew enough to say if the human military knew enough to say they were even keeping track. Some of them looked very uncomfortable to me. Like they. Like they were there, but they weren't sure what was going on. There wasn't that. I mean, I, at that point, I had a lot of comfort level on the craft, just like I had a lot of comfort level under the ground. They did not have that comfort level. So do you think they had a sense of confusion inside themselves? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think they so were they're... confused, and I think that they were, there was, there must have been something to help them um maybe that's why they had them around children because that's less threatening (laughs) i mean if they would have put me if they were to take me today and put me in a craft and put a bunch of military in there been a very different dynamic they would have been even more uncomfortable like oh geez here's these adults that know what's going on and i don't so did they have uniforms on if so what kind what kind of uniforms just military. I have no idea. I was young. Standard military? It seemed like it to me. Okay. So give us more on board. So, so, so later when I, so in, in 2005, I taught extraterrestrial reality at Scottsdale College <laughs> for a term because then the president canceled the class. But, um, so, you know, around 2000 or so, that's when the MeLab information really started to come out about, you know, what MeLab was. And it did not surprise me one bit when I heard it. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah. And it didn't surprise me when I heard that there was a lot of fumbling going around. There was there was a lot of fumbling in the in the MeLab, in the MeLab world. <laughs> that didn't surprise me either. Well, I've talked to um, two or three abductees who went through the My Labs, and um, they didn't really give me much of a um, sense of the social dynamic of the situation. They, they mentioned who was there, but they didn't really give very much detail about um, you know who was in charge and who wasn't. And who, who was confused and who was ob- just observing and you know it was not uh very detailed about the social dynamic of the situations yeah i think that that rings true for me and i think that's actually why you know the military's kind of backed off on the you know the how put off and remote viewing and the whole consciousness thing and the me labs because I, I don't know if they were very good at it ever. And so now they're just going into s- straight, you know, DARPA surveillance of humans, surveillance and mind control, you know, the good old artificial intelligence way. <laughs> so uh, I could tell you to go in any direction you wanted, but I still want 
experience is not philosophy. And so, but I'm gonna let you decide where to go. You can either talk about more onboard stuff or uh, if you have a desire, you know, about particular beings like the mantids or the Pleiadians or whatever, or if you have some personal knowledge of the mind control stuff, any any area you feel is important to talk about, you're welcome to go in that direction as long as uh, your direct experience with strange events. So one of the, oh, so going back to my childhood experience, um, one of the very vivid experiences that I had as a child on the craft was that I drove the craft. That my, I I knew how to how to drive that craft. That that my body and that craft were one, and my consciousness directed that craft. Go ahead. So um, I think Grant Cameron's written about this uh, quite a bit. He, he he gathers some other people also that had, you know driving the craft type of experience. And um, I have it in my book, um, Exoconscious, Exoconsciousness, Your 21st Century Mind. That's really the book where I write, write about everything that we're talking about. I just sat down and, and decided that I was gonna describe exoconsciousness in a more an academic way, as well as um, overlay it with all of my experiences. So everything's available in that book, Exoconsciousness. So Tell us about driving the craft. So I was aware that I, I was aware of the technology. I was aware that human consciousness was human consciousness and physical human, the physical human being and the physical consciousness of the human being were both part of driving a craft. That that um, that that there was a oneness there that um that i was capable of and that i i had I, I had an awareness of where to go how to go and my consciousness had the star map within it so it's interesting no mistake um i i published so this relates right back to there so i published my book exoconsciousness your 21st century mind and and i'm i'm going on a book tour so my first book tour and I get a call from um, Dr. Edgar Mitchell to come and work on his Quantrek team. So that was an international scientific team. Uh, we researched, and the reason I went was because I, I agreed to work with him was because he wanted to study um, uh, zero point energy, so technology, uh, zero point energy, consciousness, and the ET presence. So to me, that feeling of I'm I'm on that craft, I'm navigating that craft, I am part of the propulsion of that craft, that my consciousness and that craft are one, not only with navigation, but also with propulsion. I knew I knew in my I knew in my body that Edgar Mitchell was going in the right direction. So I spent uh, six years with him. Um, working working with Quantrek and working with the scientists. Now, I want to be really clear about this. So I'm not a scientist, but you can give me a scientific paper and I can read it and usually go to sleep at night and wake up and be able to read it again with a lot of a much deeper knowledge. So I do have that psychic ability to download those words and put them into some kind of a of an understanding. Once again, that's just psychic intelligence, and anybody can can hone that hone that ability. So, but I think the reason Edgar asked me to work with him was because I was an ET experiencer. So, who let you fly their craft, and where did you fly to? It was that same craft with with the uh, with the tall whites. Yeah, the same one that I was on. Yeah. So the tall whites. Uh, we think and maybe it's not even tall whites. I'm just that was what they looked like to me when I've seen all these different beings that I can relate to. That's that's they were tall. They were they were light filled. They were white. They kind of had that long white hair. They were they were kind. People talk about Nordics. They talk about uh, right. Pleiadians. 
and they look like perfect humans with yeah. all the right part. Uh, you know, the the almost clones of each other because they're all too perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that there's a lot of that? There's is that what kind thing. of what you're probably. talking about? Probably. Okay. The long white hair, the the kind of the glistening. Perfect human. Yeah, perfect humanoid. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, kind, not really. I know Charles Hall's book about the tall whites. One of the reasons sound like I, very kind. I didn't, didn't really, it never resonated with me. I'm like, well, maybe I didn't see a tall white. Maybe it was like more like a Nordic, because that never. They weren't mean. They were they were very kind, and it's it's almost like. So I I run these exo conscious coaching groups for people and. It's, it's almost like um, the integration part where you start to realize that these anomalous experiences that you're having, that they're not just for that time, but like me driving the craft. So then what happens to me later in life? I, I go to work with Edgar and this team of scientists and... Um, and I, I get involved in that kind of work and I'm still I'm still um, somewhat involved in that. And I'm so aware that, you know, when I see these chemical rockets go off from Canaveral or, you know, whatever that no, we're not there. So where did you fly the craft to? Where did you go to with? Your you know, I didn't really I don't have a memory of a destination. I just have a memory of doing it. And right. knowing that I could do it and knowing that. I liked I liked doing it. I liked doing it and that not everybody got to go up and do that, but I got to do that. So did you have to stick your hand in something or was what did you do? I mostly just I stood there and just um, it was mostly like through my hands and my body. The navigation was through my hands and my body and my consciousness. So you, you said you had some angel experiences. Give us an angel. I did. Experience. I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so there's a man here in Phoenix called um, Harold Grandstaff Moses. He's wonderful. He does a lot of work with physics and harmonics and frequencies. He runs the Phoenix Choir. It's called the Phoenix Choir. He's just a wonderful man. And I had gone to one of Harold's um, conference concerts one night. I got I got in there late, like it was like. I don't know, after intermission and I got in and I, I, I set up on the balcony and I just listened to these to these tones of music that the choir was singing. And. And I went home that night. And I'm in bed and I am awakened by this being in my bedroom who is so tall and so brilliant, such a brilliant light. That I'm like, kind of like in a cartoon, I'm like scooting, <laughs> scooting up the bed. I'm like, finally, it was a her. I looked at her and I said, you've got to tone this down a little bit because it's like, I can't, I can't. It's just, you are, you are like so full of brilliance. And um, she told me her name was Helen. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Um, which Helen, if you took, if you take Helen apart, Helen is L E L. So Elohim, Helen Elohim, um, then um, she told me what I was doing. I was I was doing good work, that I was on a good path and um, that that actually that that frequency of the music had brought her into me. So that was my first quote, angelic, angelic encounter. It was wonderful, though, but Sweet. I have to say it was a lot. You've had others. Yeah, but that was the, probably the mo int most intense one I've heard. I mean, when I was a child, I was so I was raised in a minister's house, and I remember my mother was reading. She had this little book. It's called "If Jesus Came to Your House." If Jesus came to our house, and I remember looking at her and saying, "Jesus comes to our house all the time." I don't know what the big deal is. I mean, this book's silly. This is, you know, Jesus is Jesus is everywhere. He comes to our house. <laughs> so even as a child, I was very well aware that, you know. These were spiritual beings and that I I was part of them, that I was I belonged with them and it was another. So in, in my groups, I now define exoconsciousness as the innate human ability. So every human has the ability to develop these innate psychic abilities. 
So um, of exocon what I call exoconsciousness. So that exoconsciousness is the innate ability to connect, communicate, and co-create, most importantly, co-create with ETs, multidimensionals, and spiritual beings. So I do have people in my group that um, that see Jesus, that see Buddha, that see angels, that see archangels, and um, and and have a very uh, vivid relationship with them. And there's a there's a crossover between all of these beings and the ability to see them. So just because I I have seen ETs doesn't mean that I haven't seen multidimensionals or I haven't seen spiritual beings because I've seen all of those. So give us some one or more multidimensional experiences. Well, I think I would think orbs are multidimensional. Okay. Um, so our um, our coaching group's doing an orb study. I, I don't know if you've read the book or if you read his work, Robert Temple. Have you read the work of Robert Temple? No. Oh, he's just a, a, a massively intelligent writer. And he's written a lot about Egypt. He's written a lot about China. And his new book is all on plasma science. It's called A New Science of Heaven. And um, the plasma science that he discusses um, just so deeply resonates with me. So there are these um, massive plasma clouds outside of Earth. And um, they're three times bigger than Earth. And as you as you probably know, um, you know, Aristotle and, you know, this, the study of, of uh, ether. So there's solid liquid gas. So the forms of matter are solid liquid gas and then ether. So we, and as, as humans, we think, well, the progression is solid liquid gas and then ether and going into ether to plasma, ether's plasma. But it's also a charged particle. But his uh, his science, and uh, actually a lot of sciences, certainly the electric human and um, that that I don't know if you're familiar with that school or not of electric humans, electric science. They they would say it starts plasma science, so plasma, gas, liquid, solid. Yeah, there some people are trying to decide whether the sun is. Uh, plasma plasma charged gas or is it nuclear like as in uh, well nuclear holds a charge so i think you know probably when it comes down to it it's you know scientists drawing lines in order to lines of demarcation to protect their research <laughs> so i think there's probably a plasma quantity but i think orbs you know one of the things about plasma because it holds a charge is that it's it's it feels intelligent when you're around it so um i've had a lot of experiences with orbs i have i have people in my coaching group that have ongoing orb experiences and they they all they talk about you know it changes color it changes frequency it has an intelligence it communicates with me um that's plasma that's a charge and there's also artificial orbs that um the military is developed of plasma. So but a lot of these are just, you know, dark programs. You mentioned my uh, mind control and um, the dark side of, of things. What do you know about that? Well, I've studied, you know, the CIA mind control programs for years. I've had client after client that have been, you know, especially Canada, Canadian clients, probably the worst um, exposure to mind control and Canadian clients um, that was going on there. And um, I've had. Um, I So one of the things that happens when you're an experiencer is that you're keenly aware of frequencies because you're operating on that frequency level and mind control is 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 given as a frequency so it's not just that so you're you're looking at at, at military at military programs and darpa programs so um so step one was 
we we develop the technology to read your mind. Well, you know, back with George Bush in 2000, he did the first you know, uh, brain initiative brain initiative work, and it kind of flopped. But at the same time, the DNA uh, work was going on, and so um, you know, mapping the DNA, ma mapping the human DNA, and so um, the brain flopped, and so. What happened was um, they said, well, you know, wow, let's use the same protocol that they use for mapping the human DNA. And um, so they um, they went into the brain like that. They started mapping the brain in sections and and uh, d different kinds of neural connections. So they are definitely able. They have technology to read the human mind. It's absolutely. And it's also connected to DNA, quite frankly. Because DNA is a frequency. So Charles Beaver's DNA is different than my DNA. My DNA has a frequency that your DNA doesn't. And so um, now that, you know, we have a whole data bank of probably by now with sentient world technology um, at Purdue University, every person's been identified of what the frequency of their DNA is. So they can be signaled out and communicated with. And so they can read they, they can read that frequency they can read what's what's in your mind it's like your phone I, you know talking about arkansas one day and three articles show up on my phone the next day i mean that they have an ability to to read what you're talking about to read what you're thinking and step two is uh, we're going to influence your thoughts and actions so not only are we going to read what your mind is we're going to tell you what to think we're going to tell you what to do. We're going to tell you how to act. We're going to tell you what to think. So you don't any longer need these barbaric MK Ultra CIA programs to um, put people into these, you know, horrific states and experiment with this, them with psychedelic drugs. But technology now they can use genetic engineering to, to actually tell you to send you a frequency that you will be acting on transmitted through your thoughts and actions that you didn't even know that you had. Sweet. So this whole thing like Elon Musk, I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a, um, a neural link in your brain. I mean, no, they don't need to do that. that that's, that's just, you know, if they do, it'll be a silly little thing because they, I mean, um, DARPA, that DARPA N3 project, they're already wirelessly um, having brain to computer soldiers. <laughs> I mean, they've already accomplished that. The military, as as uh, I don't know if that was back engineered, that was forward engineered, but you know, they've already got that um, that magnoelectric transducers they call them that they put in the soldiers, and they tell them what to do and where to go, and they they read. They read their sensory array. They read where they are. So, um, so do you know anything about human flown craft? Back engineered, fully developed human flown uh, saucers or anything of that nature? Oh, that the government has has UFOs. Yeah, that's, is that what you're asking? That's that what rumor. You're the rumor that I hear, yes, it's floating. Oh, yeah, I think they're pretty sure that government has UFOs. Why wouldn't they? I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that NIMSA project that came out of, um, you're familiar with NIMSA? NIMSA? Uh, uh, not really. I, I, it sounds familiar, but no. Yeah, it's, NIMSA was, a, was actually a German program that was brought over here to America prior to the Wright brothers. Now, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, so I'm not going to denigrate the Wright brothers, but they really were not first. <laughs> But um, yeah, the NIMSA program is German, brought over, and um, the Sonoran Air Air Force Club uh, Air Club over in California were doing a lot of experiments with with flight. And um, a group of NIMSA also um, brought to Lincoln during the Civil War flying craft, but they didn't have the money really during then to to um, Walter Bosley does a lot of research in this. So and it also you know it's German, so we're talking about the Bell at this point. We're talking about the Nazi Bell. Talking about anti-gravitics, so yeah, absolutely. So what do you, I mean, how do you believe? What do you believe about archons? What do I think about archons? Yeah, the concept. It, I think it comes originally from it's Gnosticism. What's that? It's Gnosticism. Archons are Gnostic. Gnostic theology. Yeah, I understand that, but 
my point is that, okay, so some people uh, like you and me, they know that the agnostics uh, talked about the archons, but the question, some people actually believe that they're real, not, not just religion. And so do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, do you think they're real? Or have you, uh, you know, uh, what do you think about the concept beyond with the agnostics, beyond religion in the real world? I don't know, first of all, that you can separate it. I, I don't think that you can separate that out because you're really talking about um, an, a higher knowledge that a person could sense. So, for example, oftentimes I'll have a client that, um, that uh, so I do therapy also, but I'll have a client that's, um, imbibed in some pretty difficult drugs and been in some pretty dark places and they'll definitely have entities on them and around them and they're they're captured by them i absolutely categorically believe that well and that's i mean that's what an archon is an archon is is a being that is par is like a parasite and that's how the Gnostics describe them. They Gnostics also believe that. So uh, Christians believe that, you know, we live in a world of goodness and light and that there is a God and there's there's some kind of sanity to this human life we're living. Um, Gnostics really believe that we live in evil and we have to break out of it, that there's no God going to save us, that we have to break out of this evil somehow. And the archons are part of that, that they're beings that are, you know, evil, demonic, however you want to describe that. It could just simply be, it could be like a positive charge and a negative charge. They could be holding the negative charge. I don't know. I mean, I guess if well, you want to look at, I, I, I don't think you can pull science and religion apart and say, because I think religion's probably gone into this topic more than science has, quite frankly. I think science and talking to charged particles is pretty recent. Theology and religion talking charges and attractions and beings is ancient. Well, okay, so I'm, uh, I've had two demonic attaching spirits all my okay. life. Sure. And one sits in my head, one sits on my back. I've seen uh, other attaching I, I saw one lady who had an attachment that came off her, came up off her body and looked like a, a gin. It mm -hmm. looked like, uh, mm -hmm. I saw it psychically. If you were standing mm -hmm. next to me, you might not have seen it, mm -hmm. but it looked like a, basically like a uh, over muscularly, muscularly developed human, mm -hmm. like, like the genies used to look like when they came out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then I've had, three or four experiences where I could see people's uh, astral body or causal mental body where their eyes were moving around in their head really fast. And I knew that wasn't their physical eyes. I knew it was mm -hmm. something else. But I knew that that was um, a symptom of them having an atta attaching spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I saw it in a little girl and I saw it in a hole where mm -hmm. everybody had it like that. And I've been in experience in places where only a third or fourth of the people were like that. And then I've been in other pl experiences where everybody was like that. Mm -hmm. So that's not uh, demons, jinn and archons are very different concepts of beings. So I think of uh, just popular culture. Um, okay, so let me let me back up a little bit. I have been in situations uh, i went through a mind control uh, experience myself mm -hmm. for about a week i was in a jail and i don't want to spend a lot of time on it because i'm here to listen to you but the reason why i brought it up is because after that well first of all i went to peru and i did the ayahuasca that opened me up psychically like opening a can of worms mm -hmm. it made me like a super psychic and mm -hmm. i could see all these dark things mm -hmm. and uh, it was like I changed the frequency slightly but anyway uh, at some point after this mind control experience in a jail 
like facility, uh, there were points where I met or encountered beings that were, um, I don't know if they were demons, but I suspect they were archons or something along mm -hmm. that concept. I'm not, I'm not saying the Gnostics were right. What I'm saying is what I experienced looked human, mm -hmm. had ability to shift, and they weren't shifting into reptilians. They were shifting like just, just uh, shifting in very strange ways. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, to this day, don't know what they were. And I have to, I have to, uh, you know, in my search, I have to figure out what, what are these beings or what were these beings? And were they the ones that did the mind control stuff? Because it was kind of off the charts. It wasn't like, MK Ultra type mind control. Mm -hmm. It was uh, and, and it, energy, invisible energy beams coming from a device. But but mm -hmm. the point is, is, it was like the technology was like something the Greys do in the real world when they look into your eyes and they they consciously go in through your optical nerve mm -hmm. into your brain and create another world inside of you. Mm -hmm. They have that ability. Well, there is technology that'll do a similar type of mm -hmm. thing when they point it at you. This invisible ray weapon, whatever it was, uh, you'll you're going to experience some really strange things in your head. And but associated with all that, or tangential to all that, was these shape shifting beings that were. You know, you would think they were human because they, you know, all, for all intents and purposes, they were looked human, but they were mm -hmm. definitely not. And I, to this day, don't know what they were or are. And so I'm just, among my many tri uh, searches for knowledge, I'm trying to figure out what are what are these things. And they're very dark, mm -hmm. and they walk mm -hmm. among us, and you don't know that they're mm -hmm. not human, but mm -hmm. they. Uh, you know, I don't think they're reptilians either. I think they're something else. I don't know. Mm -hmm. what, so, I think there's a real. Um, so just how I navigate reality is um, I don't do drugs and alcohol. Like I. I well, that's I, how I, I, got I, I'm, that's I'm just saying, boy, I, so, so, the, so the reason I don't do it is I, I know the power of the attachment that comes in through those. Yeah, well, that's how I got my attaching spirits. I stayed high morning and night for 18 yeah. years, yeah. age of 16 to age of 34. So that's how I got my attachments. I found yeah, that out when sure. I was in Portland. The psychic told mm -hmm. uh, a lady I ran into, I never met the psychic, but the psychic told her that I got my problem from smoking. And and she thought I was, she was talking, her psychic never mentioned what, smoking what. So the lady thought her psychic friend was talking cigarettes. And I was like, no, not cigarettes. It was pot. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I got my attaching spirits. So um, so it's kind of like the whole, the United States ran that zombie apocalypse um, uh, uh, scenario. Remember that? I don't know if you remember that or not. The military ran that psychic uh, zombie apocalypse scenario. No, I, no that one. No. And, now, and now you look at America. I mean, you go to any major city it's like the zombie apocalypse <laughs> you know it's like the zombie apocalypse takeover so it's just drugs it's just it's just drugs and and, and the and the interesting thing is i i think it's sort of like are you going to use your energy to figure out what they are or are you going to use your energy to get rid of them because i think if you well, go no, my attachments attaching spirits are not the same as the people that that you know we're referring to two different things so the people that that I couldn't figure out what they are, those are people walking amongst us or right, what right. looks like humans. Uh -huh. My attaching spirits are are very demonic, uh, actual demons. The one lady who saw the uh, the first person who saw the one that sits in my head, she called it an imp, I M P, mm -hmm. which is uh, if you look up imp and wiki, that's a small demon or mm. um, or earth spirit. And so the one that sits in my back, I was in jail uh, one time, and this guy, 
was meditating on the ground. This guy was sitting in the bunk and he looked at my back and he said, you know, you have a small demon, a demon sticking its tail in your back. So different people have seen Mm -hmm. my attaching spirits. Nobody has ever seen both. So, but, um, you know, that's different from. They're real. I mean, I don't. I don't doubt that you had them or have them or or what. I mean, they're they're absolutely real. Yeah. Well, I was asking you about archons, not demons. So we're talking apples and oranges. Well, archons are also, you know, they're kind of like um, demons of higher worlds, I would say. (laughs) Or demons of other worlds because they have this, I I, I don't know, they have this, um, the way I understand them is, they it's almost like a, a higher classification of a demon well you know i i think of archons based on just you know it's odd things i've read here and there if you jay went Weiner, up to, jay Weiner if, talked a lot about them and well if you if, if you go um up to another dimension let's say you went up to the fifth dimension mm-hmm. And a lot, a lot of people think the fifth dimension is love and light, and other people say no, it's it's still dual, dualistic. Mm-hmm. So you have higher level beings that are positive and higher level beings that are negative. So the archons would be there on the fifth dimension yeah. or the sixth or whatever, mm-hmm. and have more power. And the demons are on a level below us. Right. And so. And more easily attached to us there. There's also the elementals. Have you heard of elementals? Yeah, of course. Earth yeah, Earth. Steiner. And it's, it's interesting. Earth. Yeah. When we st- first started talking, you were talking about um, Sasquatch. And there's a did you, do, do, do you follow Rudolf Steiner at all? No. Uh, that would maybe give you some insight, um, especially his book, Knowledge of Higher Worlds. But um, he talks a lot about elementals and and nature and how elementals interact with humans. And there was a, a very famous um, healer in the Steiner School called Ari, A-R-E, Thorson, T-H-O-R-S-O-N. Um, he's Swedish. And he came to, he has he has just amazing psychic abilities. He, he just came to America for a visit about a year or two ago. And he saw Sasquatch here. He he came and he said, there is this being in America. And he started describing Sasquatch perfectly. Well, uh, as an elemental, talk, if you talk to the people in the um, Sasquatch Museum, they say there's 3000 sightings across the United States. But I talked to um, what's the guy that uh, the UFO researcher that. That has he's written like thirty books. Um, he's got his own YouTube channel. I interviewed him recently, and I, don't, I always forget his name. I don't know why, but uh, he he does a lot of out of body travels. And mm-hmm. um, anyway, he he said that there's probably a uh, hundred times that amount of sightings of Sasquatch in the United States. It's not three thousand. It's more like 30,000 per state, you know, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. I don't really know who's who's closer to the truth. They, within the museum, they mark every sighting on a map. Mm-hmm. And they were talking 3,000 total in the United States. And he's saying, no, it's like 30,000 or 30,000 per state or something. I don't know, some way, way off mm-hmm. a much higher level of si- number of sightings. But he, Sasquatch has been seen even near Atlanta, you Mm -hmm. know, even closer to the city by people. So, but, you know, that's another topic altogether. Yeah, so so that's, uh, I just found it interesting that someone who's, who is a Steiner advocate and has really learned how to see into these higher worlds, which is really what we're talking about, or these other worlds, however you want to define it, that he, uh, he comes here and he sees Sasquatch. Very interesting. I'm going to need to go. (laughs) All right. Well, um, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you, Charles. Um, Let me go ahead and stop the recording now.
Here we go.